Welcome to International Gospel Center, halfway between New York and Los Angeles, on the interstate I-44 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at the Peoria exit, where the lights are on, the flags are flying, and the Word of God is being preached, and Jesus is being exalted, and our theme number 36 in a series, Behold the Son. We are here to talk about Jesus and to lift him up. I want to read tonight some wonderful verses of Scripture for you. But before I read them, I want to remind you that we have undertaken a series of studies of 12 great themes. Number one, to Christ we come. Number two, God is not dumb. Number three, behold the Son. Tonight, number 36. Number four, what He has done. Number five, it's for every one. Number six, we add the sum. Number seven, we use our tongue. Number eight, we mark the bum. Theme number nine, we learn to shun. Theme number ten, we shake the glum. Theme number eleven, we start the fun. Theme number twelve, we know we've won. And then we'll cap it off with we get the mun or something. But we're on theme number three. Behold the sun. And as we talk about this tonight, our, our uh, motive is to help you get the big picture in your Christianity. Not to divert you to small pictures or small sections, but to help you to lift up your eyes and to inspire your spirit so that you can see the framework of the big picture. You know, on the news media, I notice that they have each day what they call the big story. And they run that a couple of times every day. And they like that copy, the big story, because it holds people to the screen. Well, we like the big picture of Jesus Lord. Behold the Son, the big picture in our Christianity. For if we don't have that, then we miss it all. And we're going to deal with some of these, some of these, uh, these, uh, these ideas concerning the big picture tonight. Because, as I said today, if we see Jesus, then we become like Jesus. What we see is what we become. It's the most effective seed that can be planted in us the view that we hold of life. From the beginning of time, it has been very important to the great people of God that they see the right vision. Abraham, father of the faith, was told to go look and see northward, southward, eastward, westward. And in essence, God said, if you can get the picture, you can have the land. You there? Thank you for your enthusiasm. If you can get the picture, you can have the land. If we can see it, we can possess it. If we see it in the framework of God's picture for us. And when by seeing, we possess. Therefore, our doing depends upon our seeing. Never forget that. If we don't see it, we don't do it. If we don't see it, we don't have it. If we don't comprehend it, 
it doesn't become part of us. So tonight's subtitle, the message of tonight, the subtitle of tonight's message is to understand and take command number two. What you comprehend, what you catch on to, what you understand, that's a way of seeing it. And when you see it, you can have it. So, as, as God said to Joshua, the same thing, as they were setting out to march around the walls, God told Joshua, see, I have delivered the city into your hands. Every effect of redemption must be perceived by faith. And that perception is the light that comes to us through knowledge of truth that forms in us the big picture that we walk in. I see myself in God's plan. One of these days, on some occasion, I'll preach to you or somewhere about David who sees that God has enemies. He doesn't have any enemies. But God has enemies. Any enemy of his is God's enemy. Because David understands himself and sees himself not in a plan of life for himself. But as a factor in God's big plan. Get the big picture of life. So, there are five steps. We get the vision. Number two, we add information. And that's what I'm helping you on tonight in this second message on understand and take command. First, we get the vision. Second, we add information. Third, we reject contradiction. You bet. Anything that lifts its heel against the image, the vision that we hold before us, we reject firmly. Hey, reject it. <laughs> Don't accept it. Ignore it. Don't calculate it. How many people have gone to physicians and have gotten and have waited for a report? And the report has contradicted what God said for the believer. And they immediately froze on the bad report and started fighting it and frightened by it, and tighten up in it, and lose their sight of God's deliverance, and accept the blight. We can't do that. First, we get the vision. Second, we add information. Feed the vision. Nourish the dream. Never the dream can die if we feed the dream with information. You'd be amazed at the wonderful books that Daisy and I have. You say, I don't want any book but the Bible. The only problem with that, when people read the Bible, they read the Bible with a pre-programmed attitude. The Bible has all truth. The Bible isn't a part of truth. All truth is there. But truth is odd. When we read the Bible, we are pre-programmed by our religious culture. And so we have learned from childhood what to think about everything we read in the Bible. So, our minds are pre-programmed. Now all psychologists tell you that it's very difficult to reprogram -pro the mind. So I say number two, add information. 
We have a great quantity of beautiful books. We read them. Why? To unlock our stalemates. To unlock our thinking. To facilitate our pre-programmed, rutted brains. You say, my brain don't get anything from God, it's my spirit. Okay, let's not argue about that. Most countries don't have two words for it anyhow. So let's not worry about uh, things that uh, you couldn't even interpret if you tried to teach it. I believe truth will work in any language. So, so we, we, we do that and we read broadly because we don't want our mind to keep cutting the same rut. You can, you can, whatever you think when you read is what you believe you read. You see. But I want to read terminology that will alert my mind and make me think. You know in the church we talk about revival. We talk about waves. They come and they go. Did you know if you will analyze all of those factors in Christianity, you'll find out they all boil down to the most marvelous, miraculous phenomenon in the human life. It will all boil down to words. We are the only creations that God has ever created who can, cap, who can think to start with, think creatively. Animals think pre-programmed and their, their genes program their thinking and their instincts. But we are the only creatures who think creatively. And then in addition to that, we have the marvelous, miraculous ability built into us to capsulize our thoughts into sounds and then to announce them, put them out in the air where they can be captured and assimilated by another person through the ear and affect the thinking process. And in that way, we are capable of sowing seeds because words are seeds. And we are therefore able to change people and grow people like what we announce around people. That's why, which is why, I should say so many parents grow naughty and mean children. Because they program them for that by telling them all that they will never be and all the bad things they will do. They have exercised the miraculous power that God has given to human beings to, re to create people according to the words, the seeds that are sown. There's not an animal in the world that can change another animal. But we human persons can totally change and mold and form another human person by the miracle that God used in creating the world. Speaking it and saying it. And it was so. And so you and I, therefore, must take words. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Learn words. And so we read widely because we want our minds to be alerted, to think. Then once they're alerted, then we go to the scripture and say, Ah, oh, of course, there it is, plain as day. But I've read right over it all my life and never saw that in the scripture. Why? I was pre-programmed by my religion, whatever it was, to think in a limited form on every verse that I read. But I go out here and I'm, I'm alerted. I think back to, my, back to what I said. Revivals. Uh, uh, waves coming and going. It all boils down to words. Somebody. See to start with in religion. We're always suspicious of anything that's new. And of any word that's out of context. Or used in a different framework. If it doesn't sound quite like we're accustomed to hearing it, we are always suspicious 
and judgmental. So we draw up an aha and we give it the once over or the twice over or the ten over or the hundred over or never give in to it because it's different than we were taught to think. And so we're very suspicious of words. The greatest science in the world is the use of words. It's making you every day. The television is forming you every day. The products of America and the companies of America are existing off of you. And they go to the TV and program you to come and buy it and convince you that you need it. And without it, you wouldn't make it. And you do it exactly like they say they use the gift that God has given them. And Christians, someday, and some Christ Christians are awakening more and more to the absolute irrefutable power of words that we can sow in people. So back to revivals and waves. They come and go. Somebody in the church happened to get a new idea or an old idea but framed it in a new terminology and ventured to go preach it and everybody said, ouch. Great historian, Bible uh, Christian historians tell us Every revival was resisted when it first broke. Always was resisted as heresy when it first broke. We don't think that because we know about revivals after they have popularized by acceptance. But every revival began as a rebellion. Every revival began as a reformation. Every revival began and was, and was rejected as heretic. But... If it was real good, they kept saying it, and finally some other rebel around the crowd picked it up and said it, <laughs> and someone else said it, and some bigger preacher decided to say it, and pretty soon it got to rolling, and lo and behold, we said there's a move of God in the land. Beautiful. All it was, was an old idea reformed, restated, many times new ideas, but usually uh, an idea that is part of redemption, and it was captured and became popular, and everybody went for it. And isn't that beautiful? That's the proof that we can help people. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way things work. So, I say, get the vision. Add information. That's number two. Add information. Take in the Word of God. Seek. Look for that idea. Be sure the vision fits in the redemptive framework. Visions that contradict redemption are fantasies. Be sure your vision, your ideal, your concept, your picture fits in the framework of redemption. Then go for information. Feed your dream. Hallelujah. Boy, here I am, 66, as on fire as I've ever been in my life, as thrilled as I've ever been in my life. Do you think that's because I'm still saying the same things that I said when I was 21? No, I'm saying those things, but I'm feeding the vision. I got a picture when I first, when we came back from India and God dealt with us and oh, how he spoke to us and gave us those four visions. And then we got, I came across the wonderful, some wonderful books that taught us the reality of now faith. And we began to walk in that faith. But ever since then, we've nourished that picture. Nourished that picture. But we got the big picture. I will go to, if, if, if Jesus doesn't come, I'll go to my resting place thanking God for E.W. Kenyon who wrote about redemption. And put it in books. So that I could take it and read it. I, as a young man, got the picture of redemption. I still have his books. I still read his books. He was a writer far ahead of his time, but his books are at the base of the great revival of faith that's sweeping across the world today. But I say, get information. Feed the vision. Now, 
we're coming, we, we've come into an epoch of a world of, a, of, of communication and of information and of knowledge that's being disseminated all across the world. By There's never been a time in the world, in the history of the world, when so much knowledge is available at once. And when so many, many channels of knowledge are open to us. We are so rich. Look at Russia. The, look at the Iron Curtain countries that are opening up. They are grasping for just a book, just a chapter, just a gospel, just a little bit of gospel, just one little tape, any little thing. And whatever they get, they copy it and copy it if they have to by hand. Never been a people, never been an age when so much information is available. So, in that information, and it is coming to us all the time, we have to keep the big picture clean cut. Like we tell Dennis on our artwork with a nice thin white a black line around it or white line around it to distinguish it. We want the redemption picture clear. And that feeds the vision. Then number three, we reject everything that contradicts that picture. Anything that contradicts the redemptive uh, status of me as a believer, I reject. I weigh many, many, many current doctrines in that scale. And I bring them all back to the facts of redemption. I've said for a long time, if a Christian is going to have to is is going to have faith, there must be some absolutes that are established. And all peripherals, all peripheral peripherals must bow and incline themselves to the absolutes. Christians can only be deceived if they have not established absolutes which call for commitment. There is no commitment until all alternatives have been rejected as secondary and not principal. First, we must come to an absolute, a truth that we would die for. And so we stand by that truth. We are convinced of that truth. That truth has become integral to us and we would die for that truth and anything else must bow to it young people it's the only way your life will take form and have integrity and continuity and you won't be tossed you know by all the new things that's coming all the time we have to d accept we have to decide on the absolutes and then bring everything else to bow to it so that's why I say we reject all contradiction of the redemption story. Many, many doctrines come along and I read them and I say this is nice. They mean well. I know what they mean. But I cannot get carried away with that because that does not match the redemptive fact of my life. I am a redeemed person. And so weigh it all like that. Number four, we go into action. See, always, after we've got the vision, after we've fed the information, after we've rejected the contradiction, then we go into action. And then what's the result? Number five, we achieve our mission in life. Our dream materializes. We succeed. We do not fail. And God brings us through. And it is the will of God that every one of us have that kind of a life patterned in that order. That we, out of the Gospels, draw up a conclusion of the Jesus picture of us. That's why we behold the Son and look at Him who is the image of God and see Him revealed in us. Paul, the great apostle, that was the great revelation that snapped him to attention and drew him out of the, uh, out of the depths 
of his religion and made him a Jesus man. He came finally to understand that God had called him from his mother's womb, Galatians 1, to reveal his son in him. Now that's the big picture. Feed it, reject everything else, act on it, and you'll achieve. That's the story of our life. Now, in the five-fold study that we have been carrying on here for these, for, for, during these many, many times that we've preached on Behold the Sun, there have been five uh, uh, visions that we've tried to hold before you and we shall continue to do so. Number one, to behold the Son in His lifestyle. See, because when we see Him in His lifestyle, we see the pattern for you and for me to live. Number two, we behold the Son then, not in His lifestyle, but in His death on the cross. There, for us, representing us, assuming our guilt, so that we can be held guiltless. A very important basic. Number three, we behold the Son then, dealing with Satan. Now we can see him in life dealing with Satan too. But the significant part, when we see him dealing with Satan, after his death on the cross, when he went into the lower parts of the earth, when he went there and dealt with Satan, there we behold him. And as we study what he did and conquered Satan totally, he did it for us. Behold the Son. Number four, we've been emphasizing. Then we behold the Son risen, alive with a new kind of life. Alive in us. And if he lives, we live. And so we have this new kind of life. Why do we say new kind of life? The kind of life that came after he paid for our sins. Paid for our sins. Died under judgment for us. Gave up his life. Died in our place. Paid for us. But then... A new kind of life was infused into him by God who raised him from the dead. And that is the new kind of life that he comes back to offer to us. So, in our studies, we're constantly emphasizing that. Behold the Son, risen and alive for us. See, living for us, on the cross for us, dealing with Satan for us risen and alive for us and finally behold the son reigning on the throne for us yes for us for me and for you but also listen to this also reigning in us this is the big secret in Christianity Reigning in us in trouble, in trauma, in trial, in tragedy, and in triumph. All that we experience in life, if our big picture is clear, we see it all Christ reigning in us, which is the kingdom of God at work on this earth. Which is the most beautiful picture that's ever been given to human persons. Which is so wonderful that Christ stay, came back after his death and resurrection. And showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And stayed among us speaking of things concerning the kingdom of God. Of God. He came back and explained it. So important that Paul preached everywhere concerning the kingdom of God. So important that when they finally had him in prison 
at Rome and the people came to him and they gave him liberty to teach. He spent his years or months, whatever amount of time we don't know, all receiving people talking to them about the kingdom of God. Hey, the kingdom of God, the big picture, the big picture, not a spooky religious sound terminology that you may have some superstitious affinities for, but the big picture of Jesus dying, paying, rising, returning, and reigning alive in me every day, putting me with him far above all the devil's influence. Hallelujah. Marvelous fact. Marvelous fact. And so reigning in us to behold the Son reigning in us is the ultimate revelation that God wants you and I to perceive in this world. I repeat, it is the ultimate revelation. It is the ultimate faith, the consciousness of Jesus alive in you, dominating over, presiding over, having dominion over, control over, rule over, hallelujah, over all circumstances, and especially all poor little hairy demons, at least that. But over all circumstances, that is Christianity in action. I repeat, that's the big picture. Get that picture. Feed that picture with information. Reject anything that, that blurs that picture. <laughs> Hallelujah. When they, when, they, when they report to you, yeah, it's bad. You've got it. Reject the picture. Don't, uh, don't blur the picture. Feed the picture. Feed the picture. Jesus alive, reigning in you over all circumstances. <laughs> reigning in power. Yeah. Reigning in faith, yeah, reigning as the one who's paid the bill, yeah, reigning as the one who has dominated all demons, yeah, in you, the devil can't tell you from him, he lives in you, reigning, see yourself in that big picture, reigning in hope, yeah, glory to God, reigning in love, yeah, reigning in mercy, yeah, R you don't deserve it anyway, what are you trying to work it up and, and get your own merits and keep your own score and add to your virtue, no, reigning in, in, in grace, glory to God, reigning, he reigns that way. And in that way, reigning in peace and tranquility, reigning in assurance, yeah, never wavering, glory to God. Only one reason, the big picture that you see, behold the sun in life, yeah, glory to God on the cross, yes, hallelujah. Dealing with Satan, poor devil, yes, glory to God, risen, you bet, wow, reigning, yeah, on the throne, light, power, ever, but more, coming back in the form of the Holy Ghost, taking up his abode in me, yeah, poor devil, sure enough, reigning in me, alive, forever, get the big picture, my friends. Oh, I'll feed that picture as long as I'm around to feed it for you. Feed the picture. Reach out 
You can judge a book quick if it don't feed that picture. That's why you can't read a lot of those old church fathers. They didn't know a lot what we know. They were walking in all the light they had, but my goodness, they got off some of the dumbest things you ever heard tell of. You know, I mean, uh, uh, didn't Daisy say just a little over a hundred years ago there's having a big convention up there in Boston about whether or not a woman's got a soul? I mean, they didn't know it all. They had a long way to go. But we have progress with knowledge, wonderful knowledge today. I don't want people to put me back 2,000 years ago and say that's all I know. No, we've learned a lot since then. Hey, Paul, the great preacher that had the revelation of redemption, had to fuss with almost everybody he came in contact with about it. They were pretty dumb about it. They had a lot of pre-programmed ideas about this, this Jesus and their Hebraic roots and the old covenant that they would die for. They didn't know everything. Why, they'd get together and fuss over silly little things about what meat to eat or whether to eat any or not or what, what, what time of the moon they could worship. All sorts of things. Or whether the men ought to be circumcised. I mean, these are big Christians. Big deal. Smart people. Don't feed that to me and tell me i got to go back and be like them. We've learned a lot. Don't you know you don't have to be circumcised to go to heaven? Okay, come off of it. Don't be so. I've said a long time, I'm so tired of the church putting halos around all their heads back in the Bible just because there's in the Bible and telling us we're good for nothing. We're terrific. We've gained a lot. We've grown a lot. Gloria, you say, are you saying there were dummies? No, I did not say that. The revelation of redemption came from Paul. But I guess he's about the only one that had it. Him and Peter fussed up and down about it. And Peter, you know, was the head of the church. So you sure can't go against Peter. And Paul differed with him. Which one are you going to go with? Now, Apollos or Paul or Peter? I say, I recommend Jesus. Glory to God. Behold the Son. He is alive in me and in you. Glory to God. Are you with me? Do you believe what I'm saying? I'm trying to impart something to you that'll help you through this week, that'll bless you, and that will feed the big picture. Glory to God. Oh, why, my dear friends, get you an old hymnal and read it. It'll make you quiver. <laughs> well, you read the stuff. Even the ones they're still singing, some of them will make you quiver. <laughs> you know, we change the words of almost every one of them we sing in here. If the singers, uh, I'll tell you, I, I, a lot of that stuff, you can't sing it because it will affect you. Get the big picture. Behold the Son, Jesus. Oh, I, the biggest window in my house is Jesus. Hallelujah. The biggest opening I look through is Jesus. Remember the story of the film Yentl? <clears throat> Barbara Streisand, little Jewish girl, her papa rabbi, he sneaked around and taught her some of the Talmud, broke all the laws. She ventured, she wanted to learn. No, it was forbidden for a woman to learn. She finally disguised herself as a fellow and got in university and learned. Oh, the books were precious. Is a book precious to you? Come to our house and see our books. This is the big book with the big picture. But the other books, Paul said, bring the books to me. I'm in prison. Bring me my books. And be sure and bring the parchments. The big picture was in the parchments. But the other books helped him understand. When I read the philosophers, I don't believe the philosophers. But once in a while, they make an accident and hit right in the middle of truth. And I go back to the parchments, to the big book, and find there was the big picture all the time. And the poor philosopher was trying to stab at it, trying to learn it, didn't know how, but he accidentally hit pretty close. But Yentl, 
there when she learned. And she was standing one day and singing, you know, the beautiful story. And she said, it's like, you know, I had only been, to, been able to see a piece of the sky. I never dreamed that the sky was so big. I never dreamed that the forests were so large. Get the big picture. See Jesus. When you see Jesus, you've missed it all if you don't see you. If you have committed yourself to him. That's what salvation is. And when you commit yourself to Jesus Christ, you see you when you see Jesus. The me I see is Christ in me. Now I can be all that I see. Now I'm free from the no good me. For now I see a brand new me. His embassy, you bet, is now in me. All luxury and discovery. New melody, a jubilee. I found the key, so I decree that the me I see is Christ in me. Bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we have imparted what the Spirit of the Holy Ghost is burning through us tonight, I pray that you will take it to every person here and to every person that's watching by video or listening by audio and bring life and light and a big new you into each one as they grasp the big picture in the name of Jesus Christ. Take it, accept it, right now. Jesus has come your way to live in you and to be all that he is through you. May God bless you.